What is the purpose of the European Global Strategy and how has it been implemented? Well, the main purpose of the Global Strategy, and I would argue the main purpose of any strategy, is that of uh, essentially providing an identity building process and moment uh, for a particular actor, in this case the European Union. Uh, this was actually the reason why uh, Europeans engaged in the development of European security strategy back in 2003 after the split within the European Union after the war in Iraq. And it's exactly the same type of political rationale that led uh, Europeans to develop a global strategy back in 2016. Now obviously in the case of 2016 there were various cleavages, not one single cleavage uh, dividing member states. Member states were divided over uh, fiscal policy and austerity, over migration, over Russia as sort of three prominent examples. Uh, it was also very clear that uh, the European Union and in particular one key member state was heading towards a very critical referendum, meaning uh, the United Kingdom and the referendum over Brexit. So basically the global strategy was really attempting at providing a story, a narrative, uh, around which Europeans could actually unite at a time of very deep divisions within the Union. And how has the rise of populism in Europe made action on the global strategy possible? It seems paradoxical because uh, obviously uh, sovereignism, populism, nationalism is something that normally does not bode well uh, for the European Union and one would have thought that particularly in the area of security and defence, which has been in many respects the ugly duckling of European integration, uh, precisely because security and defence is the area in which national sovereignty is most jealously guarded. So one would have thought that the rise of nationalism in, Euros in Europe today would have actually made things a lot harder when it comes to security and defence. So it may uh, strike as being uh, slightly contradictory, if not paradoxical, that precisely at a time in, in uh, which uh, populism has been rising, steps forward have actually been made on security and defence, the launch of a European Defence Fund, of a permanent structured cooperation between member states, just a couple of examples highlighting this. Uh, and in an odd kind of way, decisions such as uh, the Brexit vote, uh, the election uh, of Donald Trump, the rise of non-liberal powers, which in many respects are all connected to the rise of populism, actually made all this possible, uh, which is a, an odd, if you like, silver lining to obviously what ends up being a very negative story overall. And what does the rise of populism mean for the future of European foreign policy? It is an existential threat uh, to, uh, to the European Union. Uh, I mean, it's quite clear that in an age of nationalism and populism, uh, national states, uh, meaning the member states of the European Union, can survive. Uh, arguably, they do not do particularly well uh, in an age of nationalism. If one thinks to the history uh, of uh, Europe, uh, nationalism has actually brought uh, quite a bit of violence and suffering on the continent. Um, but the nation state survives uh, and it survives uh, nationalism. Now, as opposed to the nation state, the European Union, which of course is not a state, uh, cannot survive in the long term uh, if nationalism and populism were to take over, if you like. So this is precisely why the European Union is living its quote unquote existential moment uh, currently because it's quite clear that if it does not withstand this wave of nationalism and populism, it cannot actually survive uh, as a union of nation states, which remain nation states, but that ultimately understand that they can only protect and promote their interests and values by cooperating and by integrating with one another.